Hello, hello, my wonderful viewers. Thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about the wonderful topic of tithing, your tithes, your offerings, and we're going to see if we can dispel some of the myths in regards to if tithing is only in the Old Testament. You know, why should you tithe? Should you just give as God lays it on your heart? Uh, another important thing is, is tithing only mentioned in Malachi chapter 3, and why do people always typically go to that particular verse? Is there other instances where... Um, God mentions tithing, especially in the New Testament. Typically in the New Testament, the only chapter that comes to mind where the word tithe is used is in Hebrews chapter 7. But you're going to see throughout these series of videos on tithing how tithing is mentioned in other forms because there's, remember, the Hebrew in the Old Testament is very prevalent and God, I believe, initially translated the New Testament in Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew, and then it was translated into Greek. That's why you notice certain phrases like words, Elo, Elo, Sabachnai, at the end when he gave up the ghost. That's an Aramaic phrase that was used, and you notice how even though the English is there, that they kept the Aramaic. When he raised Peter's daughter, you notice he said Talitha Kume, which is another Aramaic phrase that was used, but that was kept in its original Aramaic phrasing, even though you see the other verses around that particular scripture and that particular portion is in English. So always remember when you're doing certain studies, especially when it comes to certain topics such as tithing, it's very, very important to dig deep into the original meaning, the original context, the original um, parallels in the Old Testament to see if those things are continued and mentioned again in the New Testament. Because there are certain things, for example, sacrificing bulls and goats that's something of the old testament that does not have to be continued today because why because jesus has paid the price as the ultimate sacrifice this so there's no more need for bulls and goats to be shed in order for us to be forgiven and now when you're looking at certain topics such as tithing you have to see okay prior to the law being given in exodus chapter 20 was there mention of it that was under the covenant of grace because prior to the law that was under a covenant of grace and after Jesus shed his blood, we're now under the new dispensation of grace. And are there instances where the word tithing or a form of the word tithing is used in the new covenant for us so that we know that we should still be practicing tithing? We can see the benefits of tithing as well. One of the biggest things that I think a lot of believers, they don't necessarily realize is the fact of how powerful tithing is and how it could help you know, their own local church and their own local pastors and staffs of their church and their own local communities in regards to allowing their the men and women of God that are there that are laymen to continue to spread the word and the gospel in the local city so that lives can be transformed, marriages restored, you know, people coming off of addiction so the power of God can be can be um seen through preaching. And it's very, very important. And a lot of churches are are losing income. A lot of pastors are having to work two or three jobs in order to make sure that they're supporting themselves and their families, and that shouldn't be. You know, we see that in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, how Paul is, is laying out an argument saying how he himself does not take the full right and full privilege of being fully compensated by the gospel, but they people who are, you know, doing the gospel and uh, preaching the gospel full time should be taken care of by the church fully. And you know, if, if you are an individual who believes and are convinced of the Holy Spirit, that for you specifically, that God does not want you to flow in this vein, and God wants you to just just take up um, random offerings based on um, you know whatever is laid on the on the particular man or woman of God. If you're going to visit a church based on the people giving during that particular thing, there's no problem with that. But I believe if we want to see a consistent flourishing of God's people of our communities. It's going to start with us as believers, making sure that we're taking care of the local shepherds in our particular cities, around the state, around the nation, around the world, by consistently tithing. And I know there's a lot, there's another, I wouldn't say myth, but there's a there's a doctrine that goes out there and saying that, oh, you know, you should just give based on how the spirit moves and leads you. That's the new covenant of grace. And I'm going to lay out for you within this series of teachings of how that does not necessarily work because <laughs> Right now, there's an article that you have already seen in the beginning of the video where it talks about how basically 20% of the global population of the church is actually giving and those tithes and offerings, I mean, when I say giving, they're actually tithing. That's giving at least 10% of their income. 
And then, then you may say like, well, you know, what about people who are giving less? That's good, but I believe the blueprint that God has set out for us as a local church to make sure that things are running smoothly, frequently, so to make sure that there is more than enough to share within your local body when it's time for you, if God has called you to reach out and to do other local forms of ministry, such as, I don't know, like maybe sidewalk ministries in certain communities, or if you're having certain events for like Easter, like Christmas, that requires like bounce houses, or when you're giving away certain food and items from your church, or going to partner with other um, organizations and or going to other areas of your city, that all takes money. And you have to make sure that, for example, if you are wanting to do these types of things, that you have enough for those ministries, and most importantly, for the men and women of God who are working in your church, who are serving you, who are making sure that everything is running smoothly when you are coming to partake of the food and nourishment based off the preached word of God. So again, thank you for joining me and let's get into it. First, we're gonna start out with certain pictures of tithing before the word tithing was actually used because one of the things I mentioned before is that, remember, there are different words that signify the tithing within the Old Testament in the Bible. And we're gonna go through them through these series of videos. But one thing I want to bring to your attention is the word first fruits. First fruits is another word that signifies tithing. I'm not going to, I'm not saying that every time the word first fruits is used, it's in connection to tithing, but there are times where tithing and first fruits are connected, where tithing is the first tenth of your income. Or in the Old Testament, when you have when they have to give the grain and the, the olive oil and the new wine as tithes, the measurement that was used is it is the tithe based on, I don't know exactly what they used to actually measure it, but basically it was the first crop, the first um, bumper crop that was shown, that's what was taken as the tithe. How they measured it exactly, I'm not 100% sure, but God took that as a tithe. And prior to, if you look in the garden, look at Adam and Eve, we know that God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He put plenty of trees that was pleasing to look at and also for them to eat. In addition to that, in the, tr in the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you can take of all the trees except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you can see that as a first fruit, because that was the first tree or the fruit of that tree was the first thing that God told Adam and Eve not to partake of. So we can see a picture of first fruits there. Again, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil obviously had fruit because Eve partook of it first, then she gave to Adam and he partook. So obviously there was fruit on that tree and that fruit, God said not to partake. That was the first fruit or first fruits that God said not to partake of. And also if you see in the story of Cain and Abel as well, you can see how there's a picture of the tithe there as well. How God didn't actually ask them from what we can see in the, in the passage to actually bring the offering, but throughout time, throughout their working, they came and they brought an offering to the Lord. Cain brought an offering based off the, the fruit of the ground of the land, and Abel brought an offering that was acceptable to the Lord based off the firstlings of the herd that was there. And firstlings is another picture of tithe as we're gonna go on. And you'll see throughout the Old Testament where the first of the sheep, the first of the calf, was to be given as a tithe unto the Lord. So I believe, even though it doesn't specifically say the tithe, but this was a picture where God accepted Abel's offering because it was the firstling, I believe. Some people say that because it was a, a blood offering, and that's probably also some relevance there as well. But I believe because it was a firstborn, a firstling offering that God didn't ask them to actually give to, they came and they gave it to out of their own heart, out of their free will, out of their benevolence from themselves unto the Lord. And that's something that's very, very important in the aspect of tithing. Tithing is not something that, oh, you have to or else. It's something that I believe is, is required and you should be doing it because it there's so much blessings where God even re rewards you. In addition to that, there's blessings that there's a ripple effect where you bless the church, the, the laymen within your church get blessed. They can be taken care of. They don't have to work extra two or three jobs. In addition to that, they're able to get resources for the church. They're able to allow the were to continue to being preached, they all, they're also able to go out within the communities and also make sure that the, the gospel is being shown and the love of God is being shown within the community. So there's a ripple effect in there. You have to keep that in mind. 
And like I said, a lot of churches are going under because it's not always because of lack of finances, but one of the major, major things is lack of finances, especially I notice a lot of times the pastors are not compensated very well and are because of the lack of compensation, having to go get another job or another two jobs. So we can alleviate that when we understand how God has set the precedence of making sure that we tithe consistently so that these things will have to take place. And also we're making sure that even people who are already saved, they're continually being fed and continually being strengthened and edified by the preached word that goes on in their congregation from their local shepherds. Let's actually read when we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, in regards to the Adam and Eve, and what I was talking about to you in the first fruits, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, verses 15 to 17, NIV says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees and grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So like I mentioned before, I believe that constituted as the first fruit that God told them not to partake of. The other trees had plenty of fruit, herbs, I'm sure, spices, I'm sure, that they could partake of and enjoy and be nourished, and also plenty of uh, tree that they can enjoy just looking at. But God said not to partake and eat of this particular tree, the first fruit to not to partake of. And we see that once they actually partook of it, they uh, obviously sin came into the world and they were cursed, and uh, the relationship with God started to dwindle from there in regards to not being able to live forever, in regards to not being able to talk audibly, face to face with the Lord. So it's very, very important to see how there's a connection there. And also in Malachi 3, when it talks about you are cursed with a curse and people say like, oh, you know, if you're a believer, you cannot be cursed. But think about this. If you are a believer and you are married and you, you're not doing certain things, like you're not honoring your wife by maybe watching porn, you may, you may not even be listening to her. She's trying to communicate with you, but you're not making sure that you're very intent in listening to her. Right there, you are sowing seeds of discord that can possibly curse your marriage. If you're somebody who who is a parent and you know you know that you know you have kids and you haven't been really spending time with them, that can create a rift between you and your child. And even if as a believer, if you're not practicing making sure that you're spending that intentional time, that can sow seeds of discord which can possibly curse your relationship. So it's not necessarily God cursing you when you don't tithe it's the it's the it's the effects of not tithing what it will happen what will happen is people will continue to be in bondage people will be unsaved people will continue to to not have their marriages restored people will not have you know have an understanding of how to steward their money the biblical way they will not understand of how to you know take care of their houses things of that nature not understand of how to take care of their business how to operate in integrity how to rely on God, rely on the Holy Spirit. They won't be hearing those things if we don't continually give to the local church so that the local church can continue to run, make sure the electricity is on, make sure bills are paid so they don't have to close down because there are many, many stories and instances where it these things happen. And instead of sometimes writing off the fact that, you know, why should we tithe? You should, you should see churches who actually practice tithing if you have certain local churches that are around you that practice tithing consistently and they preach that and yours does it, you should see you should see the difference in regards to how things are run in regards to making sure that the staff is taken care of, making sure of ministries that are going out within the local city to make sure the love of God is preached and, and seen. And also if they're able to explain even globally, make sure there's resources so that there's kids ministries, there's a marriage ministry, there's a young adult ministry, there are single ministries, there's a there's a um, there's a hospital ministry, there is a there's an elderly ministry. So those things are able to happen. Churches are able to expand when we are able to continue to give. So whether you are in a local church where there's a brick and mortar building or you're meeting in somebody's apartment or you're meeting in the clubhouse, you know, wherever you start out, it's still important even there to tie it so that the 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 pastor, the pastors at that time are being taken care of 
by your given. I know typically initially when you're starting out in those small stages, they have to possibly work, certain pastors have to work, and it's understood probably if it's just started out like maybe with four or five families, or maybe even like one or two families, then you have to make sure that if you are called to be a pastor, that God is calling you, not just something that you just want to do out of your own accord. You have to make sure that you're understanding that this is a calling from the Lord and you have certain elders and certain men and women of God who are seasoned in the ministry who can actually see this calling and actually confirm that this is what you should be doing. You should push that. And if at all possible, it's great to also stay connected with certain ministries who are flourishing, who understand how to operate a church, you know, biblically, you know, with integrity, with character, and uh, to make sure that you are going in the right steps so that you can actually be successful in what God is calling you to do as a local pastor in your church as well. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, NIV, the story of Cain and Abel, we read, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of the time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So we see here, Abel had favor with the Lord, which is another connection that we read about in Malachi chapter 3. We actually tied that there is favor and blessings that come to you by God, and this is a promise by God, and we'll see this in the further study. Continue in verse 5. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must first rule over it. We see here, Cain is able to actually be in right standing with God if he gives the correct offering like his brother Abel did. Like I said, Cain brought fruit from the ground. And if you, as you'll see in the study, fruit from the ground is accepted as a tithe to the Lord as long as it's the first fruits of the, of the ground. Possibly if you would have given the first fruits of, of, of the groundwork of the vegetables there, God would have accepted it. But we know for sure that Abel gave first fruits of his flock and God accepted that. And again, I want to bring to your attention, it doesn't say anywhere within the passage of scripture that God actually told them to do this, that God established a practice for them to do this. This came free willingly. They wanted to give to the Lord and honor the Lord. And Abel's offering was honorable and acceptable to the Lord. And he was granted favor with God because of this. And we'll see how tithe is connected with an act of righteousness. I know your righteousness is in Christ Jesus on his blood alone and nothing else, but I'm talking about once that is established, there are certain righteous acts that God sees very pleasing to him. And you'll see that in certain scriptures that we talk about and go through. I want to read Genesis chapter 4-4 in the King James Version so you can see something where I'm going to bring to light to you in regards to the teaching of tithing and another word and words where tithing can be seen throughout the Old Testament, sometimes even in the New Testament, with these Hebrew words. Genesis 4, 4, King James Version. And Abel, he was also brought of the first slings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering. The first slings here is the word bakora in Hebrew. And the offering in the verse is the word minka. And bakora in the Hebrew means firstling of a man or beast. It also says birth right? Firstborn. But the primitive word, root word of Bakora is Bakar. And it's, this means probably to burst the womb, bear or make early fruit of a woman or tree, firstborn, firstling, bring forth first child. So we see connection here, even the early fruit or the first fruit is in connection to this firstling as well in the Bakora and the Bakar. In addition to that, Minka is a word that which means offering in Hebrew. And you're going to see how this word minka is actually seen in connection to tithing in further other chapters and other passages of scripture, especially in the Old Testament. And you'll see a couple in the New Testament as well, as I'll show you. But minka means 
a portion, bestow, donation, euphemistically, tribute, specifically a sacrificial offering, usually bloodless and voluntary. See, usually bloodless. So we see how sometimes, like I said, Abel's offering obviously had blood. It was an animal, but his brother's Cain did not have blood. Possibly if he were to give a first fruit offering, God would have accepted it because we see here Minkas typically is, is usually bloodless, but it was used in this context here as a gift and an offering sacrifice given to the Lord. So it's very, very important here. And now, you know, what we're going to talk about next is an aspect of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a very, very important figure in Genesis chapter 14, where typically people will use and preachers will say in regards to how this was an aspect of tithing before the law where the word tenth is used, which is another word for tithe, is a tenth. And God accepted his tenth. And you can see within that story, right, Abram goes to war. God allows him to win. He, he gets spoiled. When he goes into the valley of where the kings are, we see how the king of Salem, the king of righteousness, Melchizedek, comes to meet him. He comes out with bread and wine, which I believe is a picture of the bread and wine that you take during communion, the, the Eucharist, the Last Supper with the Lord. In addition to that, we see that Melchizedek blesses Abram, and we see after the blessing is received that Abram is moved to give him a tenth of the spoils. Again, I'm not 100% sure how the tenth was actually measured because we know that when when you go and you conquer and you win, you get, uh, you know, we get animals, you can get gold, you can get silver, you can get um, people, servants to work for you, you could possibly get wives as well. So I don't know exactly how he went about actually calculating what was a tenth to actually give to the Lord, but God says in the portion of scripture that he accepted it as a tenth. And we can see, not particularly in that chapter, but in in subsequent chapters of how Abraham was already blessed, but he, he, get, he gets blessed to another level materially in regards to his relationship with the Lord and also promises that God actually gives to him as well. Melchizedek, in my opinion, is a picture of Jesus Christ reincarnated. There are certain other passages of scripture where we can see Jesus himself coming and uh, talking with certain characters of the Bible. I'll leave those. That'll come across the screen where other portions of scripture where you can actually see Jesus coming before he was actually born into the world to speak to men and or women of God. And this, I believe, is one example. There are certain teachings out there that say that Melchizedek is Shem, but I don't see that because you, you don't see anywhere else in the Bible where Shem is called a priest or Shem operates with the blood, which was the wine, and with the bread, which was the body, in my opinion. So the only other person and figure, especially when it gives the description of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about him having an endless life, having no genealogy, the only other person, in my opinion, that fits that picture is Jesus, especially when I when you see across this, this screen where there's other portions of scripture where Jesus comes in his pre-incarnate form to talk and or bless certain characters of the Bible. We see in Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 to 11, NLT, it says, this is Shem. This is the account of Shem's family. Two years ago, after the great flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxad. After the birth of Arphaxad, Shem lived another 500 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, if we compare this with in Hebrew chapter 7, which talks about Melchizedek, it says, Hebrew chapter 7 and 8, and LT says, The priests who collect the tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In Hebrew chapter 7, verse 23 to 25, it says, there were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. So as you can see, there's nowhere in scripture where it talks about Shem having no genealogy or parents. 
Neither does the scripture say that Shem lives forever. Only one person fits the description, it's Yeshua, it's Jesus. You give the tithe is supposed to be out of a willing heart, a heart out of thankfulness and worship and reverence to the Lord. That should be your first priority, making sure that your heart is in that posture towards God. That's what Abram did when he gave to Melchizedek. Melchizedek did not ask. Remember how we established before? I believe Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate form of Christ Jesus. And you will see scriptures come across the screen again just to let you know of other instances within the Bible where the Lord came himself, Jesus, in a pre-incarnate form before um, coming into the world through the womb of Mary. So again, let's always remember, who are the priests? The priests right now in today's day and age is anybody who is a believer in Christ Jesus. They are a priest and king in Christ Jesus, and we are a holy generation. We are a holy priesthood unto the Lord. And we are the ones who are able to serve the Lord on a daily basis. Again, not everybody is called to fivefold ministry, but when you are a believer, that's when you have an opportunity to actually work in a fivefold ministry. And even if you're not in a fivefold ministry, you're still obligated by the Spirit of the Lord to show the kindness of the Lord and also to let people know about the Lord Jesus Christ so that it can be saved as well, whether it is whatever sphere of influence you may be in right now. You are responsible by the Spirit of God by asking God for opportunities or when the Spirit of God speaks to you about certain opportunities for you to go and share the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ about his death, burial, and resurrection and how people can be saved and set free of their bondage of sin. In the Old Testament times, you know, the high priest was responsible for taking daily sacrifices and offerings, also taking care of certain priestly duties around the temple. And once a year there was to go inside the Holy of Holies, only the high priest was to go inside the Holy of Holies and to be to set the sacrifices down for the sins of the nation of Israel. And as today, again, we as priests are to share about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and preach this gospel so that people can hear and be saved. That's our duty as priests, regardless of who you are, where you live, and what your occupation is. And again, the tithe is set apart, I believe now, to the fivefold ministry. Now, a lot of people believe that you can give 10% to other charitable organizations. I'm not saying you cannot, but I believe the tithe is supposed to be set apart to do the work of the Lord in any works of the Lord that help with preaching the gospel of the Lord. In addition to that, helping with people who are poor, people who are destitute, people who need rehabilitation in any, in their marriage, in their minds, in their hearts, or any area of sin or lack that they may be dealing or struggling with. That's the whole purpose of the, the gospel being preached and also for you to give the tithe that is set apart to do the work of the Lord. And I believe first and foremost, if you are in a local church, that's where your tithes should be going so you can help continually propagate the gospel within the believers that are within your local body and also for the people who are not believers so they can actually be saved and be regenerated so that the glory and the kingdom of God can be established in your local town and in your local city. In addition to that, so your church can develop different programs for like the youth, for like elderly, for like married people, for like singles, for people who are um, possibly needing jobs, for people who may may need um, repairs on their cars, because I've heard of certain churches who have those type of things. They have like a, a mechanic service attached to the church where people can come and get their cars serviced. So, you know, that may be something different for you. You may have some type of program where you're developing a music program for people who are wanting to be part of the choir or play instruments at your church or in addition to that possibly you may have a record label where people can want to fulfill their dreams and their callings in regards to making sure that they are establishing and preaching the word of god through songs or establishing the the goodness of god through song making sure that whatever they are speaking or singing about is nothing that is against the word of god so i know a lot of people believe that you don't necessarily have to always turn everything into a sermon and preach in every song. And I agree with that as well, because we know as believers, we partake of different things that are not necessarily Christ-like or Christ-centered in everything that we are particular, whether it be video games or movies or TV shows 
or other music or other types of events, what you have to remember is that primarily is whatever the Lord is calling you to, making sure that whatever you are thinking about, speaking about, and whatever is being meditated on your heart and in your soul, that it is edifying unto the Lord and it's not leading you a downward spiral away from the things of God or what God has called you to do or away from honoring God. That's what's most important. So that's what the tithe does when you continue to bring that in. And back in the day, again, in the temple, what they used to do is the Levites would go into the cities. The Levites are, are the, the priest's assistants. They weren't necessarily in charge of actually going into the Holy of Holies, but they were in charge of helping the high priest and the the daily temple duties. In addition to that, you know, when it was time to collect the tithe, they would go into the cities with uh, a member of the high priest, which would probably be initially one of Aaron's son, because Aaron was the first high priest, and they would go and collect the tithe, and they would bring the tithe into the storehouse. And always remember that the, the duty of the priest was to, first and foremost, present divine blessing upon the people. The Levites helped with certain things like singing, carrying things for the priests, or in addition, to, like I mentioned, helping with any other duties around the temple. The high priest didn't only deal with going into the Holy of Holies during Yom Kippur, but they also dealt with daily sacrifices and offerings and also reading from the Torah and helping to uh, renew the minds of the people who would come here and preach once things of the synagogue was established. So another thing that also that God required of the priest to do on a daily basis was to present a divine blessing upon the people. That was to happen daily. So a lot of times when you hear, you know, certain people talking about, you know, this person is always so encouraging or, or always talking about blessing, that was one of the duties of the priest on a daily basis. We all know that the priests are not necessarily the ones who actually bring down the blessing, but they were supposed to be conduits of that blessing. They were supposed to pronounce the blessing and allow God to bestow the actual blessing on the people. So that this is the way that the people can see that they, they represent a certain element of kindness of God. And that was one thing, if you look at certain Jewish um, studies or certain Jewish books, when they document certain things about Aaron and his character, one of the things that was very, very highly taught about Aaron was the fact that he was very, very kind and he was very relatable with the people. And that's one thing. If you're actually going to operate in a five, five-fold ministry, one of the things you have to be is relatable to people. You have to be patient, have to be able to listen, have to, have to be able to distinguish between um, how to give the proper wisdom to whatever problem that may be presented to you when you have certain meetings that are, that are outside of you actually preaching in the pulpit. 
And on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to make sure that you are above reproach in regards to you are considerate, you are integrous, you are somebody who is faithful, you're somebody who is um, faithful to your wife, to your kids, faithful to the church. You're somebody who is wanting to make sure that God is glorified and edified in almost everything that you do. And people should be able to see that. And I believe, first and foremost, this should be a desire that is within your heart and within your mind. You know, you should know within your own right that God has called you. And I believe certain people who are under you, certain local shepherds who are mentors to you, should be able to see this calling within your life and, and also confirm that, yes, this is the way, this is the path that God is actually calling you to do. And again, even if you're not within the fivefold ministry, the priests are, are responsible for doing the things and the works of God, even outside into local settings, whether you're in film industry, music industry, whether you're in the government, politics, uh, banking, whatever facet or realm, healthcare, whatever facet or realm God has put you in, once the Holy Spirit has renewed your mind, renewed your heart, you know, you're supposed to be speaking about the things of God, praying about the things of God for individuals in your life, your colleagues, your friends, your family, uh, praying for the Lord to touch them so that you, they can be healed. And don't be that particular believer who is always wanting to be always so preachy. You have to also know when to just listen, when to love on somebody, when to listen to somebody, when to just have fun, when to enjoy life, when to enjoy certain things that people may be partaking in as long as it's not sin on something that is dishonoring the Lord. So always make sure that um, you are respecting people and their convictions and likewise, you know, making sure that people are also doing the same for you. And always remember that, again, whoever is a born-again believer is a priest, which means that you are somebody who's able to partake uh, of the tithe. Meaning, what I mean by that is when you are the the main pastor over your church, I believe the tithe is for your pastor and also for anybody else who's helping the pastor run the church in full-time staff. After that, the tithe should be used so that the, the church continues to stay open, the pastor is taken care of, and also his family, so that they can make sure they continue to glean from the word, receive from the word, so they can actually preach to the congregation, so the congregation can continually be refreshed, so the congregation can continually be encouraged, be upgirded in the word and the word of truth, so that they, in turn, can go out and go preach into the lost world or the people who are lost within their sphere of influence. So that's why giving consistent tithe is so, so, so important. So always remember that, that in the Bible, that God wants your tithe, not just as a command. Remember that giving this has something that is necessary so that you can make sure that things of the Lord are continuing to roll out in a proper fashion, in a system-like manner so that there is no lack amongst the people, whether it be uh, spiritually, whether it be emotionally, psychologically, in their souls, uh, even as well financially as well, because there is a divine blessing that comes upon people who do give to the Lord. God will make sure that he will pour out a blessing that there's not room enough for you to receive. So thank you. Until next time, have a great week and God bless you.